Father, in the name of Jesus, we do thank you again for this day, for this is the day that you have made. We will rejoice at and be glad in it. We thank you for your power, your presence, and your anointing. We ask God to, that you speak through us as we speak to these, your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Do me a favor and yourself a favor. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 16, verse number 5. As we get ready to, to, to finish up and conclude 2 Corinthians chapter number 13. And to give you some context and some information as far as what was going on um, in the first letter. And then what's going on in the second letter that Paul has now written to the Corinthian church. The Corinthians would have been a church that Paul, as an apostle, had established and set in order. So, in, in today's term, they refer, they refer to him as a spiritual father. He, he would have been the, the one that would have established that church. An apostle uh, in the Bible days was a missionary. These were, this was somebody that would have a special anointing to go to some place and set up a church, organize it, and then put a pastor in place, and then to proceed forward to another location to set up a church. Apostles were not set to pastor local churches. They were set to establish pastors in local churches. So Paul has some things he had to deal with, and as a, as a result, he's writing this letter because he was in a beautiful location. So in 1 Corinthians chapter number 16, verse number 5, now I will come unto you when I, when I come past through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia, and it may, be, it may be that I may, will abide, yea, and winter with you, that you may bring me on my journey wheresoever I go. So Paul is just letting them know, look, it's possible that as I go to where I'm going, that I may come to where you guys are. And if I do come to where you are, then it's probably going to be at the winter season. And back in the Bible days, nobody traveled during the winter time. Okay. There were certain seasons that people didn't pass. Uh, there was another time that Paul, uh, in, in, in Acts chapter 16, when Paul told, there was, it was like the springtime. And when they had all these uh, Eurocladum uh, storms, or we call them hurricanes and tornadoes out here in, in America. But Paul said they shouldn't go, but they just decided to go anyway. And, and it, 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 it's some things that happened as a result of that that was a consequence to them not Listen, they were greedy for the money, so they traveled during that time and they shouldn't. Now, let's go back and keep on reading. The Bible says, verse number seven, for I will not see you by the way, but I trust tarry a while with you if the Lord permits. And, but if I tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost, and again, they would have understood this Pentecost was coming. Pentecost was something that occurred every 50 years. It was a very special occasion, and everyone stopped everything they did to observe this time. Right now, Sister Rose. He said, For a great and effectual door is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. He's letting them know up front that God has opened up a great door. And he says, and he didn't say, but, but I love this. He says, and there are many adversaries. Uh, I need you to understand that when God opens great doors, great is the adversity against you. It will not be an easy walk. It won't be a walk in the park. It's going to be very difficult. There are many adversaries. Why? Because the devil does not want you to succeed. What happens in our current culture in our world in America is this. People say, well, if the enemy is able to come against you, then it must not be from God. No, that's what the enemy wants you to believe. The enemy only fights against people that has the ability to attack him. Why would he fight against you if you are no threat? I can't hear you. The enemy fights against the, the enemy fights against people that's a threat to him. He does not fight against people that's not a threat. But in America, a lot of times people say, well, they're not succeeding, they're not doing this, therefore they must not be from God. Well, maybe they're being attacked from the enemy. And Paul's letting us know. But I like the way he says this. He doesn't say this like, well, you know, I'm going to stop doing ministry because the enemy is attacking me. 
I'm going to keep on going because I'm letting you guys know that the adversary is coming. So Paul is speaking this for the people, not for himself. Verse number 10. Now, if Timothy comes, what does it say? See that he may what? Be with you without fear. Because again, Timothy did not have the, the spiritual mantle as Paul. So Timothy was not able to handle everything Paul could handle. All right? Some of you guys are great ministers or great uh, church workers, but you cannot handle what it takes to be a pastor. It's a whole different category. All right? Because most people see pastors as this. This is only 1 to 10% of what a pastor actually does. If you ever ride in a car with me, you actually hear what a pastor does outside of church. All right, these people ride with me, so they, they hear the phone ringing. So a pastor is not just sitting up here teaching a message or standing before the people leading worship. That's a 1 to 3, 1 to 10 percent at most. If a, ta if a pastor's doing more than 10 percent of the work in the church, he's doing too much. Okay? Yep. The pastoral job is to train and equip the saints to actually go do the work. So the message today is to get your eyes off the pastor and get your eyes on your progress. Because many times what happens is people come to church and they're, they're looking at their progress and they're gauging it against the pastor. The pastor's already where he or she wants, uh, he or she, uh, where God wants them to be. So that means that you have some growth to do. We're going we're gonna to unpack that in a minute, but I want you to cast and catch this. If Timothy come to you, see that he may not be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord as what? I was cut off there. Uh, as I also do. So what well, he's letting them know it's like Timothy is sent from God just like me. So God sent me, I sent Timothy. Okay, next verse, what does it say? I let no man what? Despise him. And again, uh, the Corinthian church are like, is like the American church where you have to come with this persona, this resume, you have to have the, the right um, attitude, the, the body language, you got to have all that stuff because if you don't have all that stuff, they're going to be like, who is this guy? Why is he here? He has no confidence. All right? The last thing you want is in somebody that's, that's an apostle is someone that has confidence in their flesh. The Bible says put no confidence in the flesh. Unfortunately, the American people are trained to be attracted to the confident, the alpha male or the alpha person, that one that can take charge, the, they call them the goat, the go-to person. That's the one that can help me solve my problems. Listen, can't no one solve your problems but God. Period. Okay, verse number 12. The Bible says, what? As touching our brother Apollos, and Paul says, I'm going to address this. And he was, as a, a touch of my brother Apollos, I greatly desire him to come unto you with the brethren. So there's some brethren that's coming to you. I wanted Apollos to come with them so that Apollos could see what it looks like to actually be a man of God. I'm adding that in there because you guys don't understand what was going on with Apollos. Apollos was a great, great speaker. He was a great orator. He had the exquisite and the that great knowledge, that presentation. Matter of fact, Apollos had everything that Paul had except for the Holy Ghost. Because he was not ready yet. Apollos was Apollos. However, the people were attracted to Apollos and not to Paul. Because Apollos was extremely Attractive. I greatly desired him to come with the brethren, but what is this? But he will not as it at this time. Why? But he will come when it is what? Convenient time for him. So when he gets a time to fit it in his schedule, he will come. So he won't come when God wants him to come. 
He won't come when I needed him to come, but he's going to come when it's convenient for him. Uh, Apollos. Apollos. And there are people that's like, oh, man, Doc, uh, yeah, uh, let me check my schedule. How many members you got? How big is your choir? What is the honorarium? That's the Apollos type. Verse number, that was the first number uh, uh, 13. What's it say? Watch. This is what Paul said. I need you. So in our language, we say, man, y'all better check this. Paul, what we say in our data, y'all better check this out. You better be observant. You better keep your eyes open. He says, watch. And then he says, stand fast in the faith. What faith? The faith I've been preaching to you, teaching to you, demonstrating to you before this. Because you guys are getting caught up in the moment and in all of the superficial stuff that absolutely means us. Quit ye like men, be strong. It's like, look, it, it, what Paul was trying to do was warn them that y'all about to get played. Not just Apollos, because Apollos was just part of the crew that was itinerary preachers that got paid to do what they do, and they were very good at what they did. Unfortunately, what was going on, as we're going to find out as we get back into the second Corinthians, they were trying to undermine Paul and destroy his ministry so that they can get more what we call credibility. If they get more credibility, then they got more speaking engagements. More speaking engagements means more honorariums. More honorariums means they got paid more money. So that's how it breaks down. Watch that fast here. Verse number 14. The Bible says what? Let all your things be done with what? It's on your screen. Charity. It's right there. Charity is love. So you, if, you, if it's done with love, it's not done with a desire to get paid or to be seen or to be noticed. It's done because it's the right thing to do. Somebody say do what needs to be done because it's the right thing to do. Verse number 15. The Bible says what? I beseech you. Now Paul is begging. Brethren, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus. Who's Stephanus? Stephanus was Stephen, the first, the first deacon who was stoned for his faithfulness and against commitment to God. You know Stephanus, that, that, that it is the first fruit of Ocasia that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. And what Paul is doing is he's doing what's called name dropping. Look, look, I, I, I have some background. Because if you guys remember the story, Paul was standing right there when Stephen was being stoned. Y'all remember that? Y'all remember that if you get if you be going to Sunday school. However, on the road to Damascus, God arrested Paul, and then Paul, God put into Paul the right spirit. Paul had the wrong spirit. Then God put into the right spirit into Paul. Someone said, "Lord, put the right spirit inside of me." Verse number sixteen. The Bible says what? That what is it says that you submit yourselves unto such what that kind of ministry that kind of demonstration of power in the presence of God. What Paul is saying, this is the kind of man or movement or or evidence that God is moving. This is the kind of thing you need to be connected to something that's real. So Paul is saying when you're going to when you guys go out there connect to something, make sure it's got some solid background. It's not just all emotion and got you tingling and feeling good. It sound real good because one of, the, one of the things I found out many years ago, probably about 18, 18 years ago, a lot of these very good people that are con artists, they sit in a mirror and they practice all day. I remember it was like 25 years ago, this preacher was like, man, yeah, I just get in my mirror and I practice for 20 hours and I just go it over and over and I'm like, then where is God? If it's all you, where is God? That you, that you submit yourself to everyone that what helpeth with us and labor it. And it's what Paul is like, look, if they're on the same page with us and we're on the same page with God, then those are the kind of people you need to be connecting to. Amen. My sister was telling me about a guy that was going to go start a church and like he's going to do all this kind of great stuff. That's fine. But he's got to be connected with God. Amen. Amen. I'm just 
just a black man in Rialto, right? I ain't begging, I ain't complaining, <laughs> I'm not needy, I'm not, no. But if, if you want to hear the word from God, I'm going to give you my best. That's all I can do. Because, because, listen, I can't do this without God. Verse number 17, the Bible says what? I'm glad I'm coming of Stephanus, of Fortunus, and Acacia for that which was lacking on your part. They have supplied. So Paul was like, you know what, guys? Even if you guys felt kind of guilty because you were not able to minister to me the way you should have, Stephan and Acacia have taken care of the business. Don't even worry about it. Because sometimes when you come to people and you come in with a nice smile on your face, they're like, what you want? What you need. I, I remember many years ago, I'm not going to talk too long about this, but I remember many years ago I went to see one of my uncles. I drove eight hours to go see him because he was one of my uncles I really respected. This guy had, had many degrees. He had, was a highly qualified guy. And I just wanted to go see him and say, hey, uncle, I ain't in the gang no more. I ain't in the streets no more. I'm doing all right. It took him like three hours. I sat in the parking lot of his, of his uh, office. And he finally came down, and he looked me in the eye like, what do you want? I said, man, I know. Got in my car, drove all the way back to where I lived, another eight hour drive. I was like, I just wanted <laughs> to say, hey, I, I finally did something. I'm proud of my life. Can you just celebrate this moment with me? Because what happened is, at the time, he was, he was the first millionaire in our family. So he was, I guess he was accustomed to people coming to him, asking him for money. No, and that, but that was not my, I was just like, I, I'm like I, I was proud of him. He inspired me. I saw him back in 1971. He came driving into our town with a GTO. So you guys are all way younger than I am, so you don't know what that is. But the GTO was a very nice car. It was navy blue with a white vinyl top. And the, the, and the, and the gas cap was solid chrome and it was polished. With the big giant wheels in the back. You know, well, you're my age, so you know what I'm talking about. But they, they, they don't. But I was like, wow. And it, it, I just, you heard the car come down the street and I was like, it was impressive. And he had one of his colleagues in the car with him, and it was like, wow. I said, well, one of these days, I'm going to drive up, and I had um, got this car. Uh, the car was brand new. For, anyway, but I was like, oh, man. Paul, like, I, I, I can relate to Paul so much because it's like, I'm trying my best to do my best, but you don't even notice me. Verse number 18, I, I know people go through that, and you guys go through that. We all go through that. Yes, sir. He thought I was there to borrow money. I never know. After he gave me that cold shoulder, I told him have a nice day. I rolled my window up, and I drove back to L.A. No, I didn't explain it at all. And now it's too late. But, uh, no, I didn't explain it. Yeah. Well, he's still alive. He just can't comprehend. Anyway, let's move back to Paul. Paul, verse number 18. I'm 19. Verse number 19. The church of Asia. Uh, 18. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore acknowledge them as such. And so Paul said, men, when these are, they refresh my spirit, in other words, Paul says, these people encouraged me. They lifted me up. They supported me. He's not just talking about material stuff. He's talking about in the spirit. Amen. Uh, I... You know, a lot of people don't come to church anymore because COVID happened or whatever. And it wasn't that many coming before COVID. So I'm not really tripping. I know a lot of my pastor friends are quitting, getting divorced, 
committed suicide and just, just given all the way up because they are accustomed to all of the people. I, I've been alone, like, I've been, it's been like this most of my life. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it ain't been easy. But, but I'm serious. But I'm, listen, I don't put my confidence in people. So when I come to church, I'm not looking for the people. I'm looking for the presence of God. And a lot of times people are addicted to people. Listen, people would let you down. Just I want you guys really just think back real quick to Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, every people, all the people in this, the entire city lined the streets and said, Hosanna, Hosanna, the king. Y'all remember that? If you remember your Easter stories. They threw their cloaks in the, in the thing, the palm branches. Why? Because the king was coming. That was Jesus. Y'all remember that story? One week later, they said, what? Crucify him. We like Caesar. Find it in your Bible. It's in there. So if you're sitting around letting your emotions and your faith and your anointing be based on how people treat you, you have some ups and some downs. And now I share with you this. You have a lot more downs than ups. Because many people in our culture don't like seeing you happy because they miserable. Misery loves company. So you got a nice big giant smile on your face, you better be careful who you're smiling around. Because everybody not going to smile with you, baby. Right? You smiling and celebrating and they frowning and complaining, you need to stop talking and find another crew. That's just my advice to you. That rhymes a little. Verse number 19, the Bible says, what? The church of Asia, Asia, salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you with much Lord, with the Lord, with the church that is in their house. And again, Paul is accessing and showing these people, look, I have actual um, a resume of people that God has saved and delivered and brought through me. These people don't have nothing but fluff and puff and, and air. It sound good, makes your flesh tingle. It makes sense to your flesh. They ain't got no credit. They don't have no credibility. Verse number twenty, the Bible says, "What all the brethren greet you, kiss you. What is this? Kiss you one another with a holy kiss." I can talk about this for a minute. My brother, my brother, my brother, my oldest brother, who <laughs> he became a minister at sixteen. He would be out in the lobby of the church. God says to greet everybody with a holy kiss. And he would only go to the ladies. <laughs> I, I said, brother, that kiss ain't holy. <laughs> He's like, you ain't no minister. And I said, that's fine. That's fine. I can tell you some things that happened as a result of him not listening, but I, I, let's move forward. Verse number 21, the Bible says, the salutation, this is the salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. And this is salutation is a, it's a courtesy common greeting that when somebody gave, they greeted. We, we live in a world now where people don't even talk. You can walk down the street and say, hey, good morning. They'd be like, that's how you guys have been trained and equipped in California. But where I was raised, we looked at each other in the eye, we waved, and we said hello to everybody. Hey, hello. It don't matter. But, you know, it's, it's like, it, like back in, that, in, that, in the South, we used to sit on the front porch. And when somebody drove down the street, we said, hey. And they would stop sometime. Hey, girl, how you doing? Hollering out the window. Right, I remember as a kid, my father would say, we would go to a different people's house, hey, y'all sit in the car, we're going to go in here and holler at them for a minute. I'm like, why would my father go in the house and yell at people? That's what I said as a kid. But that was just a, a way of saying salutation, conversation, and greeting. Man, I'm so glad to see you, and we are one. And they would be in the house for like an hour, two hours, sometimes three. So back in those days, kids didn't have kind of mindsets they have these days. Kids these days will come like, Mom, we gonna be done. I'm tired, let's go. No, if mama say sit in the car until I get back, you sit in the car. 
until they got back. Period. You was hot, sweaty, you rolled the winter down, you drank your spit. That was it. That was life. Now we call children's services. They left me in the car and I'm being tortured. Rescue me. I need my comfort zone and my safety pet. I'm sorry, guys. I was from a different generation. Moving on, verse number 22. The Bible says, if any man love not what the Lord, Jesus Christ, let him be a, an anathema of Maranatha. And it's, when, he, when he paused, I look, man, y'all just going to do you. It's basically because, again, Paul is speaking a language they would understand in those days. You know what? You are not with us. You're going to do you. Be yourself because we're not on the same page. Verse number 23. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all. Jesus Christ, amen. Now, let's go to the conclusion of this matter. We, I mean, then we're going to come to... Uh, back to Colossians, I mean Corinthians chapter number 4. 2 Corinthians chapter number 13. Verse number 1. If you dare say amen, if you feel like sharing with your friends, that's fine. First, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 13. We're closing this out. Now Paul says, oh, you know what? I, I did want to read something to you guys because I think we missed the introduction to 2 Corinthians. So 2 Corinthians... So the purpose of 2 Corinthians in my Bible says since Paul's first letter, that's what we just read and, and, and reviewed just now, the conclusion. The Corinthian church had been swayed by false teachers. That means they had been convinced by false apostles, pastors, and teachers who stirred the people against Paul. They were coming against Paul. They claimed that he was fickle. That means he was double-minded, unstable. They claimed that he was proud. That means he was stuck up and was not listening to God. They, they claimed that he was unimpressive, unimpressive. That means he did not listen to God and he was no one you should be listened to in appearance and in speech. He was dishonest, unqualified as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And then the Bible says Paul sent Titus to Corinthian to Corinth to deal with these difficulties, and upon his return, he rejoiced to hear the Corinthians change of heart. Why? Because Paul sent Titus or Timothy over there, and they understood what was going on. Actually, it was Titus. And then um, the, the the this was says the, the Paul wrote unto the rebellious minority. So it was a small group of people that was listening to Apollos and all these other itinerant preachers. Who then the Bible says throughout the book he defends his conduct, and that's what we did in the first 12 chapters in 2 Corinthians. Paul is defending himself, his character, his calling as an apostle of Jesus Christ. To distinguish his epistle from the first epistle, he gave it uh, Corinthians B. We, this is, uh, we just finished Corinthians A. This is Corinthians, well, actually, it says Pro Corinthos B, is what it said right here in. So this book here is the second time he's not writing. But let's go back here because Paul came with two letters and Paul came in person. So now Paul is saying, I've come to you guys three times trying to deal with this. And this is number 13, verse number one. So again, he came twice with the letter, once in person. When I was in school, two plus one equal three. Yes? All right. Math is, math is different now. Okay, so Kim, you may have been in school when they had the new math. Are you kind of young? Uh, you was probably in school with that. The, the new math, I can't do. Well, y'all math, y'all make it, they, make it, they made y'all math extremely difficult. But back in my day, back when I went to school, two plus one equal three. I didn't have to explain it. I have to work it out, show the equation, and so I got to, I take two, I put one to it, I have three. That same math put people on the moon, put people in Mars, and solved all the world's problems. All of a sudden, now, now you got to explain how. Look, I got to take two lines. I put one line to it. I have three lines. Why well, got to explain that? But you have to do it these days. I am totally serious. Uh, my son Christopher, my son Christopher is 15 years younger than all the other kids. So one day I, I decided to help Christopher with his homework, solve all his problems in 15 minutes. He went to school and got an F. 
Because it was out con it was a new map. I was like, so I hired a tutor because I don't speak garbage, I speak uh -huh. truth. You take two lines, you add a third line to it, there are three lines. There's no need to explain that. <laughs> make, does that make sense? Yeah. All right, but the, the, in the new math and the new way they teach now, the outcome, outcome base it, it does not work. It, it, it's different. It's a whole different. So I, I venture, I would venture to say that it won't be any engineers with this new math inventing anything that's going to change the world. It's too complicated. Moving forward. Moving on. Again, three times. Chapter number 13, verse number one, the Bible says what? This is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Now, in my Bible, those are all in capital letters, which means Paul is now referencing a scripture that was said before. Go back to verse number one. We are not at verse two yet. The third time I come unto you, again, two times in a letter, one time in present person, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let, shall every word be established. That's an old, old Testament principle. In other words, if you don't have two or three witnesses, shut your mouth. That's the Bible. If you don't have two or three, if you don't have a corroborating witness, you need to be quiet. Shh. I know people have a hard time with that. Shh. Shut up. You don't, where are your other witnesses at? And listen, the, your witnesses cannot be, be coached. So don't go grab yourself a posse. I know some people, they know how to grab posses. I don't like them. I don't want you to like them either. No, let people learn people on their own. They don't need your input. Moving on. Verse number two. It's got quiet on that one. It must have some, got on somebody's street on that one. Verse number two. Don't look nowhere because somebody may think I'm talking about them. I will proceed. I told you before. And I foretell you. And Paul was like, look. Guys, this should not be a surprise. All the stuff that you guys are experiencing, going through, I let you guys know what to expect. What was about to happen, what the devil was getting ready to do. He says, as if I were present the second time, being uh, absent now, I write them to, to them here, heretofore, have sinned, and to all others that I come again, I will not spare. Well, Paul's like, look. Uh, I, I have talked to you guys already about, about this stuff, and if I got to come, if I come, okay, back in, the, it's like back in the old days when parents were parents, it's hard to talk about this these days because uh, parents be yelling and screaming, it don't mean nothing. My mother never screamed. My dad never yelled. They looked at you and say, you do that one more time, I'm going to beat you over behind. That was it. If they were in church, they didn't even say words. They would just turn around, look at you like, that was it. You froze. You could be doing the most demonic, devilish thing you could think of in your mind with all your friends on the back row. Your mom turned around and said, Psst. You stopped. If they rocked their finger twice, you were going to get a beat down when you got home. Period. They will go back to praising God and thanking Jesus, and all your friends go back to being silly and goofy. And you sit there like, I'm going to be real good for the next two hours. Maybe they'll forget. Right? Y'all remember? This, this, world don't, this world don't understand that because, see, this world now will argue with their mother. Their mother. That was unimaginable. <laughs> That was unimaginable in my day, to argue with your mom, talk back to your mom. You would got, get knocked the heck out. People would be in their mama face. I'm like, whoa. I'm serious. When I moved to California, that stuff tripped me out. 
and did it. I had never seen anything like that before in my life. People talking back to their mom and raising a voice. California, you guys are a trip. Paul I told you before, before I tell you, he said, if I were present the second time and being absent, I would write to them, uh, which they, uh, therefore have what? Sin, and to all others that if I come again, I would not spare. Paul's like, when I, when I come, if, when I come back, y'all still got the same crap going on, the same mess going on, I ain't biting my tongue. I'm letting the hammer down. Amen. Back in my day, they had a saying, you know what? Just wait till your daddy get home. That meant something these days. That don't mean anything in California. Most people in California don't know who their daddy is. Right? And daddy is a wimp. Mama got the money. It's, the, the house is a mama name. If daddy started tripping, she kicked daddy out. It's a whole different world out here. Right? But back where I grew up, Daddy had full power and authority. When Daddy came in the house, house went quiet. Daddy said, move, you move. Daddy said, sit down, you stop. There was no conversation. So whatever mama couldn't handle, that's cool. You go ahead, man. Just wait till your daddy get home. And see, what Paul was doing here in this letter, because again, I have to explain that because again, California, a whole different mind. But Paul would have says, when I come again, I would not spare. Because Paul was the spiritual father. Verse number three. And I have to explain a lot of stuff again because when you are in California, it's a whole different world. You have to explain how the world should be. Because we have no concept. This is verse number 13. 2 Corinthians chapter number 13, verse number 3. This is what it says. Seek ye a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you what word is not weak, but is mighty in you. And what Paul is really just letting them know, guys, is look, everything that God has spoken through me that's working in, in you is doing a great work. It, it works. You may not like the way I look. You may not like the way I talk. But when you do what God tells me to tell you to do, it's actually working. All that pretty stuff ain't working. Huh? That pretty stuff. Listen, I'll tell you about pretty stuff. Pretty stuff, it really appeals to your flesh. Listen, don't let your flesh make decisions for you. Lean not to your own understanding. Your flesh is your understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. That's God. He'll direct our path. Listen, but the, the pretty preachers, they really, they say, speak to you. I, I've heard this many times. Yeah, pastor, you know, they just speak to my spirit. What spirit are they speaking to? I feel them in my heart where the Bible says the, the, the heart is desperately wicked. Who can understand it? So is your understanding coming from you or is it coming from the word? Is it coming from your, your top being in the presence? God's literal word is or your interpretations? Where is that coming from? And this was going on with the Corinthian church. Because Apollos was significantly better than a Paul in a presentation and appearance. Paul could even hold up a candle to Apollos in the natural. And some of you all when they see you, probably like they see me, like, oh, right? They're like, just like, when people see me, they be like, Ugh. And then I, I share with this, and what, what encourages me is one of my favorite people in the Bible is David, because when David came to the battlefield, when Saul and all the army was hiding in a tent, and they saw David walking up there with that cheese and the bread, they were like, ugh, why you here? Right? That's how they treated David. Like, why are you here? And where'd you leave them little sheep? And they were like, is there not a cause? Y'all over there trembling and nervous. And then the Philistine comes out and Goliath's like, wait a minute. You mean to tell me this is what y'all scared of? David says, let me at it. What? See, sometimes we despise small things, small beginnings, small people, whatever, because we're so overly impressed by superficial surface stuff in America. 
America is not the only country on this planet. And if you keep on gauging yourself by America, you're going to miss a lot of good, God's good heavenly glory. The Bible says, since you, since, since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in me, which to you, Lord, is not, is not weak, but it's mighty. It's like, look, y'all know what God has been doing through me in you. And you still asking for proof and evidence? Show me the proof of the people that speak in these pretty words. What miracles have they done? What wonders have they done? What have they done to save and improve your life? Huh? You've given thousands of dollars, sold seed, planted on this good ground, did all this stuff, read all these scriptures, quoted and manifested. When is it going to manifest in your life? You sit up getting angry at God because you listen to the people that don't even know him. Verse number four, the Bible says what? For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Paul is letting these people look. Look, like, look, what you guys call weakness is actually strength. And we discussed last week when Paul was talking about his thorn in the flesh. And God told us that my strength is made weak and it's made, made what's perfect in your weakness. And Paul's like, look, you want to look at Jesus like he's some kind of wimp because he took a beating? He took that whooping for you. He took that whooping for me. He was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of his peace, of our peace was upon him, and with his strength, we're the one that's healed. There wasn't nothing wrong with him. He wasn't sick. He wasn't a sinner. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Get caught up with that Catholic. Let's just stay, 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 stay focused in the Christian world. I, I, that was wrong. And I can't help you guys that you have learned some wrong information. Leave it alone. Yeah, let it go. Let it go. I can't, I can't help who you listen to on YouTube, who you listen to on Facebook. All I can do is give you what the Word says in the literal Word. Okay? When Jesus Christ, uh, John chapter number, just for, just for the record, for the people on Facebook, in John chapter number three, verse number 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's period. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you from your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's what the Bible says. All these other stipulations that come from these other religious organizations, they're just trying to get you hooked, make you feel as though you're special, and then take your money. Because I guarantee you they're going to raise an offering. God's, God's gift is a gift. You don't pay for a gift, and you don't earn a gift. If he gave you salvation, just receive it and say thank you. Period. You'll never be good enough to be saved. Right? Y'all remember the story of the rich young ruler that came to Jesus and said, man, he says, what must I do to inherit the kingdom? He said, well, do this, do this. He said, man, I've done all this stuff for all you. He says, well, go ahead and sell everything you got. And the guy went away bitter. Y'all remember that parable? And Jesus, but the Bible says, but Jesus loved them. Why? Because this guy was fully committed to doing the right things, but he was doing all the right things for the wrong reasons. Just because you're doing all the right things don't mean you're right. You could be doing all the right things for the wrong reason. I'm sorry to laugh at you, but I, you know what? I guess we are going to have to go to Galatians because it's not by works, but listen, any man should boast. It's a gift. It's a gift. You ain't never going to be good enough for God. You're never going to be able to give enough money, pray enough, go to church enough, dress nice enough, talk nice enough, act nice enough. No. What makes us good enough for God is to be covered in the blood of Jesus Christ and accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's it and that's all. It's not your works. If that was the case, why, why would you? Let me share this with you guys. Just, just a few reminder. When Jesus was getting ready to die on the cross, he said, Lord, if there's any other way this can be done, let's figure that out. And he's like, okay, nevertheless, 
Not my will, but yours be, yours be done. In other words, that means between the time he said that, the Holy Spirit and God let him know, look, this dude, this is the only way. You are the final sacrifice. You got to go to that cross. You got to bleed and die because the wage of sin is death. Somebody got to pay the price. Guess what? Boom, you it. He paid the complete price. And listen, because he paid the complete, complete price, there is nothing you owe. But I thank you. So the next time somebody gets, gives you a gift, don't ask them how much it costs, where to get it from. Just say thank you and enjoy the gift. That's it. That's all God has said. Thank you in all things. Give thanks. Verse number four, five, the Bible says, the Bible says what? This is what Paul says because Paul, like, look, we wrapping this thing up. He says, examine yourselves. In other words, you need to do a spiritual autopsy on your spirit, your mind, your souls, your thoughts, your imagination. You need to really, here's uh, what I was getting, when I was sitting here getting ready for a Bible study, I was like, well, does your magnifying glass work on you like it works on me? Someone said, neighbor, does your magnifying glass work on you like it works on me? Hmm. He says, examine yourself. Now, everybody in here, if you, uh, what, you know what, even the children, you, you have been through an examination. I go have to get an exam every year for my physical. And I'm sitting on the table with this little apron on with my back out and just exposed to the world. And the doctor comes in there. And they stuck this little this wood in my mouth that tastes nasty. They grab this thing and stick it in my ear. Right? They grab that stethoscope and stick it on my chest. Tell me to cough, tell me to breathe. Tell me to bend over, tell me to do this. I'm doing all this stuff. And they thumping on my stomach, touching on all kinds of stuff I don't want them to touch. Y'all know about all that, right? They are examining you. Right? Because I asked them one day, I said, what you, what are you doing all that stuff for? They said, well, you hear that? I said, yeah. They said, it sounds hollow. I said, yeah. That, that means you don't have any cancerous tumors. I said, oh, okay. I never knew what it meant. I just know when I go to the doctor, they be like, mm-hmm. Okay. Did y'all know what that meant? I didn't. So I asked. Because I don't like being touched. At all, I do. I'm serious. I I'm not making it up. I do not like people touching me. But and my blood pressure goes up to like 175 over 190. <laughs> this this just me. But it's like this. When the Bible says examine yourself, what, what he's saying is, I want you to do a full spiritual analysis of all your thoughts, your actions, and your reactions. And then when it says, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. What Paul is saying is, what, since y'all got all these questions to ask me, you can listen, listen to all these people, and you're trying to tear me down. I need to find out oh, if y'all is or if y'all ain't part of the same body that I believe. Do you believe in the God that I serve? That's what he's asking. Are you of the faith? Then he says, I love this. He says, prove, what's this now? Your own selves. So all those things you want me to do to prove myself to be an apostle, prove you a child of God. Since y'all trying to prove something. Huh? Take the speck out your eye before you try to take the beam out of your eye. Actually, is what the Bible says. Before you try to take the speck out of my eye. Before you try to analyze me, make sure you got a good microscope. Huh? And then use that microscope on you first. Before you analyze my spiritual walk, go and check out your spiritual walk. How many people have you wretched this week? How many souls have you motivated? How many people have you encouraged? How many people have you told about Jesus this week? I had this one sister, man, she would just tear me down all the time. I said, well, you know, you've been going to church for 30 years. How many souls have you won? She said, none. I said, okay. But you've just focused on what I'm not doing or what I am doing. 
but you're not saying this and you're not helping me do this. And I'm like, that ain't my job. My job is to give you the word. It's the Holy Spirit's job to help you. Because if I had the ability to help, I wouldn't be working. I will just be out in these streets every day, all day. Boom, you go do this. Boom, you go do that. Bam, empowered. It doesn't work that way. Somebody plants a seed and God, if somebody waters and God brings an increase. If the Holy Ghost does not draw you, there ain't nothing I can do. Amen. Don't fault me because you don't like me. I hope y'all catch that. That's a Facebook post. All right? But I'm going to tell you this. I'm doing the absolute best I can. But it's, this is what Paul, Paul says. Examine yourselves, whether you be of the faith. Prove your own self. Know you not your own self, how Jesus Christ is in you, except you be what? Reprobates. In other words, if you can't examine yourself, that means you don't know Jesus. When he says, if you're, what he says, if you're reprobate, that means you don't know God and God does not know you. So if you can't, if you, all you can do is examine me and pick me apart, but you can't spend no time on yourself, Paul is saying you're a reprobate. And a reprobate is someone that has no hope in God. That means you're permanently assigned to Satan and his destiny. Verse number six, the Bible says what? But, this is what, this is what he says, but I trust that you should know that we are not reprobates. No, we ain't not being. I love the way he includes them in it because the, the way Paul does is look, look, since I am your spiritual father, if y'all reprobates, I'm one too. Right? Verse number seven, the Bible says what? Now, this is what I love this. Well, I love all this book. We'll wrap this up. Now, I pray to the God that you do no evil. Now, why is he saying this? Because the other itinerant preachers, the fake apostles, was trying to get them to tear down all of Paul's ministry. And then they were trying to get other people to believe like they believed. They were trying to draft the posse. I'm going to share this with you guys. If you have some dirt, know some dirt, really have some proof, that's not your job to get in the parking lot and share with everybody in the parking lot. The Bible says if you have an all against your brother, go to him or her. Alone. These days people share. Well, did you hear what the deacon did? Did you hear what the minister did? Did you hear what the bishop did? Bishop. Mm, bishop, right. And then, then people say, like, oh, yeah, girl. And then I, you know, I just I was on TikTok. I saw something on Instagram. And then the next one's like, yeah, you know, I saw something on Facebook, too. And you know, I saw something on YouTube. Ooh. I know he went no good. Now, I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved. And what Paul says, look, not as though I need to go ahead and, 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 and appear as though I'm somebody anointed, special called by God. I'll I, I put it in reality language. I ain't got nothing to prove to you. And I'm going to share this with you guys as we move forward. If, if you have to explain yourself to your friends, those ain't your friends. Your friends should know you, your emotions, and your feelings without explanation. That you approve, but he says, but that you should do what is honest. You, you know deep down in your heart what's God been doing in you through me. Just be honest with yourself. Don't, listen, the reason why a lot of people get derailed in the body of Christ is they make decisions based on emotions. Do not make emotional decisions. I don't care how swift, how smart, how intellectual you are, your emotions are not always right. Sometimes you're wrong with your emotional self. Well, I have good instinct. I have good intellect. Who the heck told you that? You're just as human as the next person. You make mistakes like everybody else. You ain't perfect. Don't let emotions make your decisions. 
Because there are too many elements in the, in the soup. There's too much of you involved. And you definitely not perfect. The only thing that's perfect inside of you is the Holy Ghost. We jacked up. This, this flesh is corrupt. That's why it's going back to the dirt. And the Bible says put no confidence in this. All the stuff you studied, all the stuff I did. Well, that ain't what I studied. That ain't what I heard. That ain't what I know. Who the heck are you? What is the Holy Ghost saying? We listen to ourselves way too much. Well, I remember this. Shut up with your memories. Cast down every thought and imagination that exalt itself against God. He says, but we should do that which is honest, though we be what reprobate, as reprobates. Now, when he says as reprobates, it's like, man, we're acting as though we're there. And then Paul just backed up the other scriptures, no, but we're not. Verse number eight, keep on reading. What does it say? He says, for we can do nothing against the truth. I, 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 and when Paul's letting these people know, look, you guys can't come against God. I don't care what you believe from these false apostles and prophets and all these other people. For we cannot come, do nothing against the truth, but the but what's this? But for the truth. In other words, I can only do what God says. The Bible says, "For God's word is truth." Amen. There are people that have all kinds of truths, all kinds of revelations, all kinds of theories. We was listening to uh, early before with the church starts. We listened to to Cana Carr about you're bigger than the universe. You're bigger than the sun and the moon. There are people that's worshiping the sun and moon. I go to places and weddings where people say, "I just pop positive vibes to the universe." What is a universe? The universe was created by God for you to enjoy. You are a man created by God to have dominion over all of that. Why would you bow down to something you have dominion to? We have dominion in the power of the Holy Ghost over the heavens, the sky, the earth, the water, and everything under the earth. We have that authority by God. So if God gave you that authority, why would you bow down to something you have authority over? That's with the Holy Ghost. If you have the Holy Ghost, the devil, this world, the planets, the moon is under your authority. You don't bow down and worship to something that you're over. Amen. I love my children, but I ain't worshiping not one of them. You do what I say when I say, bam. If you do what I say when I say, you don't get no trophy. You don't get a pat on the back. You just did what I told you to do. We live in a world where people need to, hey, did you see what I did? Yeah, you did what you're supposed to do. Now go do it again and do it better. You're a mean parent. No, I'm the right kind of parent. Y'all got the wrong kind of parents in California. Everybody get a trophy now for doing nothing. Oh, I showed up with my baseball uniform on. I get a trophy. No, you don't. You didn't win no games. But I practice every day, and look at my glove, it's nice and new, but you ain't never caught a ball. But look at my bat that my dad bought me, it cost $300, but you struck out every time. And I know that sounds cold and cruel in California, but in the rest of the world, you strike out, you struck out. You don't get a trophy. You didn't catch the ball, they were like, y'all lost. Hi. Now you can do that. Oh, they're shaming people. That's rude. Um, that's um, uncaring. I don't know what other words they use. You ain't getting no pizza. You don't go in the gym and do some push-ups. These days you get pizza and a trophy and a picture. And see, that plays right into the devil's hand. You ain't got to do nothing to be celebrated. But Paul says, run the way, run, run the, the race in a way to win the prize. He says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to press toward the mark of the high calling. This is not no thing. This is not, listen, everybody don't get a trophy. 
You got to do this thing the right way. You have to do this thing God's way. The truth is the truth. The truth is, they won, you lost. You ain't no champ. Come here, champ. You my champion. No. You know what? Next year, we're going to do better. We're going to go back to the drawing board. We're going to learn our plays. We're going to get on that soccer field, baseball field, football field. We're going to run. We're going to run those drills over and over again. We're going to run the, the baseball. We, we, we're going to run harder, faster, and stronger. And next time we get an opportunity, we're going to win. That's reality. That's how you're supposed to do it. All right? And that's why Alabama wins all kinds of championships. California does not. Because they don't celebrate losers. No, you better go back and do it again. No, you got 10 more miles. You tired? No, you ain't seen tired yet. You ain't tired till I get tired. Let's move forward because I'm, 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 I'm in California now. I ain't knocking California, but man, we got like, you ain't never gonna win no fight when you think you're supposed to win because somebody looking at you and you look pretty. This was going, this, this was, uh, the reason why this is relevant is because in Corinthians, they were looking at these pretty apostles, not the apostle that actually went through the war. He had been shipwrecked, snake bitten, shipped for dead, shot, beaten, stoned, still working in the north, still serving God, still faithful, still committed, committed, and still not giving up. And these guys had never even had a, a splinter, but they had a nice suit on. And they spoke well. Their vocabulary was outstanding. They knew the mayor and the governor. They had all the outward attributes of somebody successful as a leader in the world. And so Paul had none of that stuff. He was busy doing God's work. I ain't fussing, I'm just disgusted. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. And Paul said, look, at the end of the day, the bottom line is this. Y'all gonna have to answer to what truth is. And look at it and take a full analysis on, analysis on what God has actually been doing in your life and through your life. And not just that, through me. Because by, by, by chapter 13, Paul is actually dealing with them. First 12 chapters, he's actually, Paul dealt, Paul used 12 chapters to deal with these people that was convinced against him by these fake people. They meant well, but they were wrong. And see, this I, had to, I guess I got to explore this because see, every devil that's doing devilish work does not mean evil. They just they meant well. They just wrong. And if you don't have the Holy Ghost, if God is not leading you, don't try to do God's work and stop talking about God's people because you are talking about things you don't understand. Well, I don't understand why all this is going on. Well, you need to go back and listen to God. God will let you know. If God don't let you know, then it ain't your business. Shut up. Learn how to be quiet. Amen. Verse number nine, the Bible says what? For we are glad when we are weak. I love this because Paul goes back because again, the fake prophets and fake apostles, weakness was not something they would not, they, they would, they, it was like, it was like, it was totally against their nature to show any type of weakness or any type of unpreparedness or whatever. For when we're, we're glad when we're weak for you and you're strong and this also in which even your perfection is like, but Paul was like, look, you want to really be perfect? Get weak. Get to a place where you realize, I can't do this without God. Hmm? Get to a place when you realize, I know y'all think I'm fussing, people think I'm preaching. And, you know, as this is, you know, it's a trip because years ago, 2 Corinthians was not that personal to me. But God was seeing you through some stuff to make his, his word personal. Just keep living. For we're glad when we are weak, for, and, you str and you're strong also. We wish even your perfection. Look, I wish you well. I love Paul. Look, you go ahead. I wish you well. I wish you the best. But I, at, at the same time, I, need, I want you guys to know the truth. There is no truth that does not come from God. 
period. I don't care what history book, what apocrypher, what story, what philosopher, what you read in your science book, your whatever you read, if it does not come from God, it's a theory, it's information, but it's not absolute truth. The only absolute truth you get is from God. God's word is truth. There's a, there's a huge difference, there's a different, uh, there's a difference between information and truth. I'm not going to stay there long. I'm going to close this up because I am tired. I was hungry. No, I ain't got no, we still got another hour of praise and worship, so it won't be no nap going on right now. Wednesday nights are hard. <laughs> Thursdays, uh, my class be like, hey, like, hey guys. But I'm going to tell you, God gives me strength. I, don't, I sleep very well on Thursday nights, though. But God gives me strength because I'm normally in the bed at 7 p.m. The Bible says, for when, uh, verse number 10, what the Bible says what? Therefore, I write these things being absent. What does it say? Less being present, I should use what? Sharpness. What is Paul is saying here is, look, um, if I was in y'all presence, I'd be going off on y'all because y'all be tripping. That's Rialto translation. Right? He says, therefore I write these things being absent, less being present, I should use sharpness. That means I'm, I, if I was in your presence, I'd be going off. He says, I should use sharpness according to the power. That's what, that's what Paul says, and God has given me the authority to go off. I am the apostle. I am the leader. Right? The only person that should be chewing out anybody in a church should be the leader of the church. Period. You ain't no leader. Stop chewing. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. Shut up. That's not your assignment. Amen. He says, sharpness according to the power which the Lord has given me to edification. This, I'm going to share this with you guys. Because when God uses a pastor to chew you out, it's going to benefit you. If any of you, I don't know if you guys have ever been on, on a good team when, when you had a good coach. Well, if you, if you was on a good team with a good coach, when you went back to the locker room and you, your, your team was losing, your coach did not give you lollipops and butter, butter, uh, butter balls and cotton candy. Your coach chewed your butt out and re reminded you of the plays and reminded you how hard you worked and how good you are and what the heck you're supposed to be doing. Get your head out your behind and get on that field and do your job. That's what a coach did. Is it, anybody been ever played on a team with a good coach? They don't rub your back and say it's all right. Oh, you did your best, Johnny. That was good. You know, they're bad. No, they didn't do that stuff. They yelled at your behind. Some of them threw chairs. Huh? Threw the cooler. Kicked the tables over. Threw your helmet in the corner. Huh? So if you, if you want to wear this uniform, you better wear it. They'll rip it off your back. If you had a good coach. These days, we want people to stroke us and comb our hair and scratch our, scratch our forehead. Oh, Johnny, it's all right. No! And that's what Paul is saying. Look, 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 look. I don't want to come to y'all like that. Now, sometimes a real good, good, good coach, after he finished chewing you out, he'll, he'll walk out the room, and the captain or somebody on the team is like, hey, team, come on, guys, what y'all doing? Uh, we can do this. This is what's better than this. And that's where it comes in where the fellowship of the church, people don't like the fellowship of the church. People will be breaking out the door like they've been held prisoner. Bye. Ain't no hugging. Ain't no talking. Man, the scripture really spoke to me. And what was God speaking to you about today? And how can I pray for you? And how can I help you? That, that don't happen. Uh, bye. I got chicken on the stove. Over oh, steak waiting. Oh, gotta go, gotta go. How did the word minister to you today? They don't care. Do you need any prayer? Pastor prayed already. Bishop prayed. I'm, I'm out of here. Paul's dealing with this stuff, right? Because here's what happens. When there is no fellowship, there are no other fellows in your ship. And guess what? If you don't want a fellow in your ship, your ship will sink when there's a leak. Amen. Of 
according to, or to the power which the Lord has given me to, to what the edification and not for your destruction. And again, when, when God gives the man of God the word of God, it, listen, I'm going to share this with you guys too. You're not a pastor, so you can't say what a pastor says. Because when a pastor says something, it's going to build people up. When you say something, it's going to tear people down. You can use the exact same words, the exact same expression, but it has the opposite effect. It's just like back in the old days when, if you guys had siblings, when mama leave and the oldest kid is there, now she's trying to be the mama, right? Or you are on a job, I don't know if you guys have had a job, and then all of a sudden you have this, this junior supervisor that think they the boss. Same thing. You're not, you're, you don't have the authority, you don't have the calling, you don't have the anointing. Shut up with your criticism. That's not your assignment. If you got something to critique somebody about, take it to the person that's in charge of them. Y'all ain't saved. Y'all ain't anointed. That's not your position. Y'all out of order. Shut up. That's not your position. Your position is, hey, team, come on, let's do better. This is a better way to do it. This is what I recommend. What you guys think? Come on, guys. That's how team players talk. Come on, say, stop being the coach. Okay, verse number 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. What does it say? Be perfect, be good, be of good comfort, be of one mind. I love that. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Again. Be of one mind, again, these are conditional, live in peace, and a God of love and peace shall be with you. There's some people I'm praying for, they want God to just restore their joy. I said, well, first of all, I got to pray for God to restore your faith. Because you would never have full, the fullness of joy without faith. Verse number 12, the Bible says, okay, no, let me finish number 11. Love and peace shall be with you. Uh, then verse number 12, there go, there go my brother's favorite scripture. Billy, if you're listening, there it is, young man. Now he will quote this, greet each other with a holy kiss. <laughs> I'm telling you, he will quote that every single Sunday night. 13, all saints salute you. Verse number 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you. Amen. All right, let me close this out before we wrap it up because I'm going to wrap this whole thing up and we're going to move out of... <sighs> Corinthians. We're moving out of Corinthians. And let's go back to Paul because uh, uh, for Second Corinthians chapter number four, starting verse number eight. We're going to talk about this, this guy named Paul, this actual uh, real apostle. Somebody say true apostle. Because people think they're anointed and powerful. They never been through nothing. They don't even have a testimony. They learn how to avoid everything. This is what Paul says in chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse number 8. He says, we are what? Uh, that's not the wrong, that's not the, 2 Corinthians chapter number, I mean, sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse number 8. He says, we are what? Troubled on every side. That means I'm surrounded by problems. He says, yet not, and says, that I love is yet not distressing. So even though I got all this stuff going on around me, Sometimes people say, man, how do you smile with all that adversity? Don't nobody like you. I said, Jesus does. Huh? People be on my face, man, you just got so much patience, all them daggers and all those arrows coming. I said, yeah, but I'm doing this for God. He says, yet not distressed. We are perplexed. It's confusing, but not despair. It's like, because sometimes like you're, you're, you're saying and doing everything God says, and it's perplexing because people are fighting and coming against it. But it's like, I'm not despair because guess what? It's not my job to save you. It's not my job to convince you. It's not my job to make you understand. That's the Holy Ghost's job. So my prayer was I leave here in other places where people are confusing. I want to fight. I want to bicker and debate. God, please open up their understanding. Verse number nine, the Bible says, well, we are persecuted, but not forsaken. I want you all to catch this about this true apostle. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. He's what he's saying is like, even though I'm going through all this stuff, I'm still here. Amen. Amen. The average brother, the average sister would like the heck with this and y'all. 
Amen. I ain't got to put up with this. Paul says, I am not destroyed. I'm still here. Verse number 10. The Bible says what? Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ and the life also of Jesus Christ that we may manifest in our bodies. Just letting, letting the people know, look, I have the actual wounds. Where did the wounds come from? He was stoned. He was beaten with rods. He was shipwrecked. He was bitten by a snake. He was locked in the jail in stocks. So he has some scars. All right, and it trips me out when people ain't got no scars. They never been through nothing, but they want to talk about you because of the way you responded to your scars. Boy, you should be more powerful. You should be this. You should be that. Show me your scars. What have you actually went through and survived? I remember I saw this movie. Mel Gibson was, I think it was Lethal Weapon. He met this new partner, and all of a sudden, they started taking their shirt off. Hey, look at this. And and it's like a knife on it. Remember that one? I don't know what it was. It leaked the weapon to or something. And it's like we got people in the church. They ain't got no wounds. Their body is perfect. They never been attacked. They never been hit. They've been saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. It's the day they got on the altar saying, "Thank you, Jesus." Huh? They ain't never slipped back, slid nothing. Never dis disagreed with God, never disobeyed God, never got disappointed with God, nothing. And there you are sitting in your church on your chair, chair with all the hell going, going in your life, and you're doubting God. They're looking at you like, you ain't got no faith. You ain't got no testimony. When you get a testimony, you come and tell, to talk to me about my faith. Verse number 11, the Bible says what? He says... Uh, for we, we, we live as always delivered unto death for Jesus Christ's sake, that we like, but that the life also of Jesus Christ may be made manifest in our mortal flesh. It's like, uh, man, but what basically, he, he talks about the book of Romans, look, everything in me belongs to God. We live delivered unto death for Jesus Christ's sake. Listen, we're going through this because we are serving God. All those that live godly shall suffer persecution. Amen. You're not going to get no five-bedroom house in a Jaguar. Okay? God may do that. But if he don't, he's still God and you're still blessed. Because I could be blessed without a Jaguar. Verse number 12, the Bible says. So then death working in us, what? But life in you. And so Paul is basically saying, I, I love this because Paul is actually more acting more like a pastor than an apostle. He says, though I am actually dying emotionally and spiritually, it's for your benefit. And so this is a pastor's mindset. There's no greater love than this than a, than a man lay down his life for a sheep. Pastor will die for a church. And uh, many pastors are dying. Uh, I live in my world today that I live in. There's so many pastors getting divorced. So many pastors committing suicide. It's amazing. It's like a daily thing. It's, it's horrible. It's, it's disgusting how, how, how the world, the, the political system, uh, the church, and you know, everything else just, just come against the, per, the person that God has placed there for you. Pastors don't pastor for themselves. There's nobody in their right mind that will volunteer, volunteer to be a pastor. At all. Because you're never good enough. You're never right enough. You're never this. You're never that. You're never available. My, people tell me, you're always this, you're always that. I was like, well, you know what? I got to do what I got to do. I have to remind people sometimes, you're not the only person on this planet. Right? Every time I call you, you're busy. I say, well, call me again. Right? And because we're spoiled in America, especially California, as if the world revolves around us. Like, everything's supposed to stop when you have a need. Why do you have a need and why didn't you talk to God? Back in the sanctified church, we would say, God, I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Now, pastor! Right? And I'm not, I'm not, and I'm not, trust me, I'm not trying to make fun of you, but I need to understand this now. If the pastor is not available, God is omnipresent. 
God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. Your pastor is not God. Do not put your pastor on some kind of pedestal like he's omniscient, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful. He is just one human being. They have problems just like you do. He just knows who to go to the problem solver a little easier, a little better. That's all. I'm not, knowing, I'm not any better than anybody on Facebook or anybody in this room. I just learned a long time ago how to let go and let God. Amen. People call me smart and brilliant. I said, no, I'm not. I learned how to listen to God. I let God speak. Victor, shut up. Amen. That's what I learned. Victor, you shut up. Because you don't know everything you think you know. Your, your, your pride will come into your head like, oh, I know a lot of stuff. And then, trust me, I have a lot of information in this little pea brain of mine. But unless that information is guided by the Holy Ghost, it's destruction and not construction. That's no good. You can have all the information in your brain that's possible, but if it's not led by the Spirit, you're going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. All right, verse number what? Is there one more verse? We're almost done with verse chapter 4. It's a whole bunch of them. But anyway, but, uh, verse number 16. 16. 16. For this, for this is what I'm, I'm wrapping this because I got to go. Got to go, got to go, got to go. For this cause, we what? We faint not. I love this. We love this. I, 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 a lot of my friends that know me, they're like, how do you just do that? How do you just stay there? How do you, for this cause we faint not. For though the outward man perishes, yet inward man is renewed day by day. So guess what? What would have happened if I would have just quit? Years ago. You can believe that if you want. Yeah, but what about the people, what about that one or two people that needed to be to be available? Do you want to believe that? But if I would have quit, I wouldn't have been here. And then who would Coco have to talk to? <laughs> I know, but I, I'm just, I, I really want you guys to understand this. I'm being serious. Because I, I, I deal with this now on a daily basis. A pastor's just dying. They're getting divorced. They're dying. They're giving completely up. They're, they're giving completely up. I, I do. I, look, I can go. I can go to my messenger right now. I won't show you their names. There's 15 people in my messenger today. I'm not going to show you their names. These are bishops, superintendents, pastors. These are people who are dead. They can't do it anymore. All right, and the people are looking at them, looking at all this expectation because you you looked at this pastor on YouTube. I heard this and I heard that, and then you you're comparing your your pastor who has zero salary, zero staff, zero support with somebody that has a million dollar staff and a million dollar church and congregation behind them, and then you make him feel like a little piece. These, these people can't handle it. And then their wives and their families are chewing them out and going off on them. So there's no support at home, no support at church. And this is what Paul was experiencing here in the Corinthians. Like, wait a minute, I'm y'all apostle. I'm the one that God's been using to pray for you, to deliver you, to help you get healed and delivered. Just because I can't speak the Hebrew and the Greek and exegete and isogene like the guy on TV, that guy on TV don't be up in the middle of the night thinking about you and praying for you. At all. Right? These bags don't just come because I'm, I like being up at night watching TV. Right? These gray hairs don't just pop out. <laughs> My kid's like, man, I remember you had hair. I said, yeah, I do too. <laughs> but we faint not. But do our outward man perish? Look, it, it's gone. People be like, man, you skinny, you gold. Uh, I was looking, one of my my uh, one of my um, students was looking at one of my uh, my picture when, when I first started at the company that I work at now. He's like, "Who's that guy on that picture?" I said, "That's me." He said, "Man, you lying? That's your son." I said, "No, that ain't my son. That's what I used to look like." 
before I started dealing with church folk. I got pictures. I got pictures. But guess what? We faint not. Amen. I'm not a victim. This is my assignment. And guess what? I shall not be moved. I'm like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. And I'm going forward. As long as God say go forward, I'm going forward. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Amen. Quitting is not an option. I was never trained to quit. Can I get one witness up in here? And so this is all Paul is talking about. Look, get, your, get, look, get yourself together. Get your eyes off of me and get your eyes off on yourself. Take care of you. Get yourself together. Get your prayer life together. Don't worry about how much I'm praying. Don't worry about how much I'm reading. Don't, much I, don't worry about how committed, how holy I am. You do all. Check all your boxes before you look at my box. Amen. So I invite you guys this week to check all your boxes. Check all your boxes before you analyze what somebody is or is not doing. Because people in this world have different things that goes on in their life. And everybody can't be what you want them to be all the time. Amen? Any prayer requests? We got to go. Y'all good? All right. Well, keep Mother Robinson on your prayer list, please. I pray for her daily. I love that young lady. Uh, just pray for her body, spirit, and soul. Uh, Father God, as we leave this place, we know your presence. We just thank you for this Bible study. We thank you for the ones who are here inside the sanctuary. We thank you for the ones who are on the way, Lord God, as we move forward into our praise and our worship. Let your anointing and power be upon us as we do your will and your will only. In Jesus' name.